What would you think if we said that Earth is not the best planet for life? Authors of an article published in the Astrophysical Journal are making this claim. These scientists, using data from NASA's Kepler Space Telescope, are studying over 2,000 exoplanets in potentially habitable zones of their stars. More interestingly, over 120 of these worlds are gas giants, and each of them potentially has at least one moon. Surprisingly, it has been claimed that these moons are the places where our chances of finding extraterrestrial life are highest. And these moons not only have liquid water, but gas giants can shield them from cosmic radiation, provide magnetic fields, and even atmospheres. In other words, everything Earth serendipitously acquired might exist on these massive exoplanetary moons. However, there is a problem. Despite astronomers' efforts and observations from the James Webb Space Telescope, a real discovery has not been made yet. On the other hand, the gas giants in the solar system have 131 satellites, and many scientists believe that there may be life on these satellites and even that the celestial bodies may be suitable for our future colonization. So, how is this possible? Scientists have long believed that all the satellites in the solar system, like the moon, were dull and lifeless rocks. However, some of the satellites discovered have surprised astronomers. During the early 70s, NASA's Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 spacecraft explored Jupiter's moon Io closely for the first time. And the data revealed an anomaly. The mass of this small moon was much larger than expected. Typically, celestial bodies of this kind consist of water ice and silicates, but Io was filled with silicate rocks and iron, making it the densest satellite in the solar system. On the other hand, the thin atmosphere of Io also drew the attention of scientists. However, the radiation belts surrounding the celestial body caused malfunctions in the ion probes, hindering comprehensive research. Fortunately, this situation was rectified with the Voyager probes sent in 1979. Thanks to the more advanced equipment on these spacecraft, high-quality images of Io's surface could finally be captured, leaving scientists in disbelief. There was not a single impact crater on the moon's surface. Initially, NASA believed that Jupiter was pulling all meteors towards itself. However, shortly thereafter, long trails indicating volcanic activity were noticed in the images. It was understood that Jupiter's gravitational force was compressing and heating the interior of Io, resulting in the eruption of large amounts of molten silicate magma mixed with sulfur. These sulfur criteria and a toxic layer covering the entire surface of the moon made Io a hostile environment for any form of life. It should also be noted that when combined with radiation, this matter is highly lethal to all life forms. However, beneath the surface of Io, there are relatively safer places. As magma cools and solidifies, it creates areas known as lava tubes, where water can be preserved, and microorganisms could potentially survive. For instance, even on Earth there are bacteria capable of processing sulfur compounds, including pure sulfur throughout their life cycles. Therefore, these bacteria can select hydrogen sulfide-rich soils and waters as their habitats. On the other hand, if we plan to colonize Io, we would need to follow these sulfur bacteria and build underground bases far away from volcanoes. Otherwise, everything on the surface is likely to be wiped out within a few years due to volcanic eruptions. Nevertheless, underground bases can significantly reduce radiation hazards. However, no matter how hard we try, we cannot provide complete protection against radiation. Additionally, almost all electronic devices will constantly malfunction here. So, is there another place in the solar system similar to Io but without such terrifying levels of radiation? Another moon with active volcanism is Triton. Definitive data about this celestial body were first obtained in 1989 when Voyager 2 passed by it. During the mission, scientists were expecting to see a frozen and lifeless rock. However, instead, they encountered complex topography. Moreover, there were mysterious dark geysers in some places, and the temperature was 235 degrees Celsius. This meant that we were facing cryovolcanism. Under these conditions, water continues its path by burning like lava. However, we know very little about the underground water reserves where these geysers erupt. Additionally, if we decide to build a base on Triton, we will need to carefully consider reliable insulation 
instead of protection from radiation. In fact, this can be achieved using local resources such as local ice blocks converted into dome shapes. This way, water can be extracted from the region, and we can provide the needed energy with the fuel literally beneath our feet. Apparently, Triton contains ammonia, methane, and nitrogen that can even be synthesized into rocket fuel. However, the greatest obstacle to colonizing this moon is the distance. On the other hand, the celestial body is 30 times farther from the sun than Earth, and it will take at least 12 years to reach there. Our modern technology does not allow us to travel to such a distant place. In fact, even NASA's discovery missions to Triton are constantly being postponed. Therefore, it would be more logical to focus on more accessible places. Voyager missions to Jupiter's satellites other than Io have attracted great interest from astrobiologists. In 1995, the Galileo spacecraft reached the region and sent more than 30 gigabyte of data to Earth. Scientists were particularly interested in this celestial body because the spacecraft captured strange lines on Europa. Moreover, the Galileo spacecraft showed that the lines were constantly changing, and it was soon revealed that these were cracks in the ice covering the subsurface liquid water ocean. Scientists believe that the volume of matter is twice that of all the oceans on Earth combined, but the exact composition of the local water is still unknown. To obtain samples, we not only need to reach Europa, but also dig a well that reaches a depth of 150 kilometers beneath the icy surface. Of course, there is an easier way to do this. Observations with telescopes show that Europa's ocean is directly ejected into space from surface cracks. So, if a spacecraft reaches here, it can collect samples of these water molecules. Analyzing these samples will not only clarify the composition of the ocean, but also answer this crucial question. Could there be life beneath the ice of Europa? Astrobiologists believe that this moon could harbor organisms similar to Paracoccus denitrificans, which can withstand extreme conditions and are similar to bacteria on Earth. High pressure, darkness, and cold are not obstacles to the existence and reproduction of such life forms. In fact, these organisms can thrive in environments rich in oxygen as well as in oxygen-depleted environments. They can be nourished by hydrogen and sulfur compounds and can develop under extreme gravitational conditions. However, as you know, humans do not possess such characteristics. And if we intend to colonize Europa, NASA engineers will need to work harder. When we talk about colonization, you might have thought of an underwater city. However, to understand the feasibility of such a project, we first need to drill through Europa's ice and deploy exploration robots below. NASA is currently testing an underwater drone, and the plan is for this vehicle to fully explore the moon's interior. If conditions are favorable, the next step will be to build an underwater base to extract oxygen directly from the water. In fact, settling beneath Europa's ice is not an option, it's a necessity. This is because the surface of the celestial body is highly radioactive. In just one day, we can be exposed to nearly 2,000 times more radiation than the annual average radiation dose on Earth. This makes life impossible. Therefore, any issues arising in the construction of underwater bases could seriously jeopardize our colonization plans. Perhaps at this point, we should consider one of Jupiter's moons. Ganymede is the only moon in the solar system unaffected by radiation. This is known due to the magnetosphere discovered by the famous Galileo spacecraft. Typically, such strong magnetic fields are found around planets, but Ganymede is an exception, surpassing even Mercury in size. Therefore, Ganymede is almost like a planet orbiting Jupiter. On the other hand, Galileo also discovered an underground ocean on Ganymede, where not only bacteria but also larger organisms could live and reproduce. These organisms, known as radiolarians, have an internal mineral skeleton made of silicon or strontium and are no larger than one millimeter. However, Ganymede could host organisms many times larger in its waters. Artemia, on the other hand, is a crustacean living in salty water bodies on Earth. These organisms can reproduce even without partners, and Artemia eggs can survive for a long time without oxygen and water. So, if there are unknown extraterrestrial crustaceans on Ganymede, its oceans could be filled with Artemia. The presence of these organisms is so nutritious for the region that it could replace meat. This makes Ganymede quite promising for colonization, along with radiation safety. On the other hand, during the first observations made from Earth with telescopes, 
it was discovered that the atmosphere around Ganymede was quite thin, but Voyager 1 did not confirm this. By 1995, scientists managed to determine through spectral analysis that Ganymede had an atmosphere containing oxygen. Of course, it was a rather thin atmosphere. Therefore, the surface temperature of Ganymede could reach as low as 203 degrees Celsius. However, the presence of even a thin oxygen layer on moons is a rare occurrence. In conclusion, there are isolated areas in Io, Europa, and Ganymede where extraterrestrial life could thrive, but humans would need to put in a great deal of effort to overcome the lack of atmosphere, radiation pollution, and other disadvantages. However, there are also places within our solar system where such efforts are not needed. For example, this unique celestial body in Saturn's orbit could be the best place for life in the solar system, despite its gloomy and cold nature. On January 14, 2005, the Huygens probe successfully landed on Saturn's largest moon, Titan, and made a discovery that is extremely rare in the solar system. It was a dense atmosphere. Moreover, the atmosphere on this moon consisted of nitrogen, just like on Earth, and it protected against destructive cosmic radiation. However, the surface of the moon couldn't be seen clearly due to hydrocarbon smoke that blocked the rays in the upper layers of the atmosphere exposed to pale sunlight. Therefore, perpetual darkness reigns on Titan's surface. However, as Huygens discovered, the atmosphere itself is quite active. Unusual winds blow here, and warm air currents are carried. As a result, sand dunes, much like those in Earth's deserts, form in Titan's equatorial regions. On the other hand, the landscape of Titan is filled with ice blocks instead of rocks. However, like the other moons of gas giants, Titan also has an underground ocean at a depth of 80 kilometers. In this ocean, bacteria similar to those on Earth could have developed. But of course, this is not the only hypothesis regarding extraterrestrial life on Titan. Along the surface of the celestial body, methane rivers and seas flow. This substance is in a gaseous state on Earth. However, in extremely cold conditions, it can be observed as a liquid. Astrobiologists believe that this substance could lead to the emergence of an entirely different form of life. So much so that in 2020, an article was published in an astronomical journal stating the discovery of a carbon-based molecule called cyclopropanilidine in Titan's atmosphere. This was quite unusual because such compounds are usually found in interstellar dust clouds, and Titan's atmosphere was too hot for this molecule to persist. It should have broken down there. What scientists didn't know was whether these compounds could be continuously produced. After all, Titan could be a suitable candidate for extraterrestrial life. Most importantly, what made the discovery intriguing was that astrobiologists had successfully developed a model that allowed the passage of liquid methane. This model consists of nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen molecules, and could indeed form the basis for exotic cryogenic life. As a result, it seems possible that organisms resembling the ice worms living in the North American glaciers could roam Titan's sand dunes. Furthermore, in a moon with low gravity like Titan, they could be much larger. Of course, we don't believe they will grow as large as the sandworms in the Dune movie, but regardless, we will definitely discover new things about life on Titan soon. In fact, NASA plans to reach Titan with the Dragonfly mission in 2027. Of course, this won't be such a simple exploration. The vehicle will be a quadcopter capable of flying for extended periods on the surface, investigating anomalies, and landing for immediate examination. At first glance, Titan, which may appear cold and challenging, is unquestionably one of the most promising candidates for colonization within the entire solar system. Surprisingly, it is even more suitable than Mars. The reason is this. Humans will need significant amounts of construction materials to build a base anywhere beyond Earth. For instance, NASA engineers are planning to use soil and rocks on Mars. Unlike Martian rocks, Titan offers an abundant source of liquid and solid hydrocarbons, that can be easily transformed into polymers of any shape. Additionally, unlike Mars, where transporting increased hydrocarbons to Earth may be difficult, it might even be possible to send them back from Titan. However, long-term settlement will bring food and water challenges. Importing fertilizers for growing plants on Mars will be a constant requirement. In contrast, Titan's atmosphere contains nitrogen, methane, and ammonia fertilizers 
making it much easier to grow vegetables in specialized greenhouses. At this point, the real challenge is temperature. One other factor is the scarcity of water on Mars. Water on the planet is only found in the polar ice caps, requiring long-distance transportation. On Titan, water spouts directly from beneath the surface and contains approximately 10% ammonia, which serves as antifreeze. This means it can be easily augmented. Additionally, hydrocarbon rivers can be used for hydroelectric power generation. Moreover, Titan's atmosphere lacks oxygen, making combustion physically impossible, eliminating the need to worry about liquid fuel. In contrast, on Mars, energy can only be obtained from solar panels that need constant cleaning, especially after sandstorms. Furthermore, the thin Martian atmosphere consists primarily of poisonous carbon dioxide. The atmospheric pressure on Mars is only about 0.59% of Earth's, while on Titan, it is one and a half times that of Earth. Therefore, when you set foot on the moon, you will need only a suit to protect you from the cold and an oxygen respirator. The important point here is to make the respiratory reservoirs extremely reliable to prevent explosions. So that Titan's underground ocean can be filled with cyanobacteria equipped with strong ultraviolet lamps and thus produce enough oxygen. Do you think we will be able to live on these celestial bodies one day? You can share your ideas with us in the comments. A group of extraterrestrial beings may appear like this. As for me, I am just lonely human. Research will continue, and I'll see you in the next video.